Welcome to the next video in the Maintaining a Balance series. This video will be looking at two dot points from the syllabus, the first being analyse information from secondary sources to compare and explain the differences in urine concentration of terrestrial mammals, marine fish and freshwater fish, and use available evidence to explain the relationship between the conservation of water and the production and excretion of concentrated nitrogenous wastes in a range of Australian insects and terrestrial mammals. So you'll note that both of these are um, secondary source investigations where you need to gather information from a variety of places. So this video will just help to give you some background information to get you started. So we'll start off by looking at the dot point where it's asking us to compare and explain the differences in urine concentration in terrestrial mammals, marine fish and freshwater fish. So before we move on, we might want to recall that water moves in and out of cells through a semi-permeable membrane through the process of osmosis. This movement of water is dependent on the concentration of fluid inside and outside of the cells. This impacts on the role of kidneys in mammals, freshwater and saltwater fish, as they all live in environments with varying water concentrations. In this picture, you'll see three different types of solutions with blood cells placed inside them. So just um, for your information, that the names for each of the solutions refer to the solution that the cells are placed in. So in the first image, we have red blood cells being placed in a hypertonic solution. So this means that there is more water inside the cells than there is outside the cells. Okay, so there's a higher solute concentration in the uh, fluid surrounding the cells. And in, um, as a result of this, water is constantly leaving the cells, trying to balance the uh, concentration of water inside and outside of the cell. And we end up with our cells uh, shriveling. In an isotonic solution, we have an even uh, concentration of water inside and outside the cell. So you can see that there is no net movement into or out of the cell. There is a nice constant movement in both directions. So our cells stay nice and healthy. In the third image, we have a hypotonic solution, which means that there's much less water outside, sorry, inside the cells than there is outside the cells. So water is constantly moving into the cells and because we're talking about animal cells in particular, there's no cell wall that helps to protect uh, the cell membrane from bursting. So when we reach that maximum level, it's just like a balloon. The water keeps filling the cells and eventually they burst and obviously becoming, um, not being able to function. So what is the role of kidneys in fish and mammals? So up until now, we've been talking mostly about the role of kidneys in humans. So now we need to look at um, the role in fish and also other mammals apart from just us. So water and solutes are continually exchanged between the environment and the organism's body fluids. Water accumulates in an animal when it eats or drinks and as a byproduct of respiration. So we've already talked about respiration a bit in um, that respiration is the um, reaction between glucose and oxygen to give us energy that we require. But the two other byproducts of that are carbon dioxide, and in this case, we're talking about water. Nitrogenous wastes, including urea, uric acid, and ammonia, accumulate as a result of the breakdown of amino acids. So the amino acids are our building, block, building blocks of proteins, and when they break down, they form our three different forms of nitrogenous waste, depending on the organism that we're talking about. So different animals excrete different products according to their environment. Aquatic animals, fish and aquatic invertebrates excrete the nitrogenous waste of ammonia. Terrestrial animals uh, then need to convert that ammonia into urea because it's much less toxic and it needs to stay in our body for longer in order for our kidneys to be able to uh, reabsorb as much water as possible. As the products are different in being ammonia and urea and also uric acid in some animals, the role of the kidney is also different. So we've already had a look at this table, which summarises nicely the different animal, the type of environment that they live in, and the type of nitrogenous waste that they excrete. So our mammals, birds, and insects are all terrestrial organisms, but you'll see that mammals are the only ones that excrete urea. Birds and insects both excrete uric acid. Um, birds excreting it as a pay same as the insects. We'll have a look a little bit later about a way that insects conserve water. Um, and some insects are able to excrete ammonia simply straight across their body surface. Then when we look at fish, which we'll be doing in quite a bit of detail in this video, uh, freshwater fish and saltwater fish obviously both live in aquatic environments. They both excrete ammonia. However, freshwater fish 
uh, excrete that ammonia in a dilute urine with lots and lots of water, whereas our saltwater fish excrete their ammonia in a concentrated urine, so only a small amount of water. So now going to have a look at the role of the kidney in both fish and mammals, starting with the marine fish. So marine fish is our saltwater fish, a fish that lives in the ocean. So with marine fish, the body fluids contain less salt concentration than their environment. Obviously, they're in a salty environment, so there's a lot more salt outside the fish than there is inside the fish. So the seawater is hypertonic, so the fish is known as hype, sorry, the seawater is hypertonic, so the fish is referred to as, in, as hypotonic in comparison, sorry. So as we can see from the picture, we have a lot of water diffusing out of the fish via the process of osmosis. So there's obviously a lot more fresh water, or a lot more water inside the fish than there is outside the fish. So due, due to that process of osmosis, water automatically crosses across the gills and other body surfaces to try to balance out the level of water inside and outside the fish. The fish are constantly drinking, trying to replace the water that's constantly lost via osmosis, but because they're drinking seawater, they're also gaining a lot of salt at the same time. So the salt has to be excreted, obviously, and they need to try to retain as much of that water as possible. So salt is excreted across the gills as well as in their urine. However, the water is retained as much as possible. So the urine that they produce is um, quite concentrated because it has very little water but very high levels of salt. Fresh fish on freshwater fish, sorry, on the other hand, are those that lives in, live in lakes, rivers, ponds, etc., where there isn't that salty environment. And as a result, the fish themselves have a higher salt concentration than the water that they live in. So the water is known as hypotonic, and then the fish is hypertonic in comparison. As we see, can see from the picture, we now have water diffusing into the fish by osmosis. So there's more water particles outside the fish than inside the fish. So the water moves into the fish naturally via osmosis. As a result, these freshwater fish don't need to drink as much as our saltwater fish. So they will only drink very small amounts of water. In order to get the salt that they need, they will take the salts in through their gills as well. And also they will produce a dilute urine, which has got a lot of water almost continuously. So their kidneys work really hard to get rid of that excess water and also absorb the salt. So the salt is being absorbed as much as possible. So the urine that they produce is very high in water, but low in salt. So we've been looking at humans um, quite a bit in terms of their kidneys, but looking at other mammals. So mammals need to regulate their water and iron concentration as well as excrete urea. Um, so that's the role of their kidneys. So the amount of water that is released depends on the current environmental conditions and the amount of water already in the body. So obviously some organisms such as our kangaroo rat here lives in an environment where there's not much water as opposed to our beaver which lives in a sort of aquatic environment or near an aquatic environment where it has easy access to water. So we can see this picture at the bottom here shows roughly the size of the nephron in comparison to one another. So the beaver has quite a short nephron in relation to humans and kangaroo rats because they're always in the presence of water so they're able to constantly um, get that water into their bodies. So there's not as much need to regulate the water concentration. Kangaroo rats, however, live in a desert environment where there's not much water. So having a longer nephron allows them to keep those fluids inside the nephron as long as possible and to absorb as much water as they can before they create their um, concentrated urine, which is very low in water. So we have seen this table as well before, which summarises nicely the different features between the mammal saltwater fish and freshwater fish kidneys. So um, the big thing to note in this here is that the, nef uh, sorry, the kidney of the mammal has many nephrons, whereas the saltwater fish and the freshwater fish have quite simple nephron structures, which we'll have a look at in a second, with the saltwater fish having few smaller glomeruli, where our freshwater fish have many large glomeruli. Okay, the other thing to note is the filtration rate, where mammals have a high filtration um, rate and along with our freshwater fish in order to try to get rid of as much of that water as possible. And our saltwater fish have a low filtration rate. Okay, also our amount of urine produced is slightly different between the three different types of animals depending on their environments. 
So as we said in the previous slide, there is a difference in the, um, the complexity of the nephron between the three different types of organisms. So the first two here, we have our freshwater fish and our saltwater fish. So we can see that water enters the glomerulus of the freshwater fish under high pressure. So there's a high glomerular filtration rate. And we can see in both the two different types of fish that the nephron is quite simple, it's quite short. Okay, however, our saltwater fish has a low glomerular filtration rate in order to slow down the movement of um, the filtrate through the nephron in order for as much of that salt to pass through and as much of the water to be removed and um, reabsorbed back into the body. Our mammal here has, we can see there's a vast difference in the length of the nephron between the mammal and the two different types of fish. Same as um, our freshwater fish, our mammals have a high glomerular filtration rate. So the blood passes into the glomerulus under high pressure, allowing those substances to be filtered properly. So our salmon is a really interesting example of a fish. Uh, so salmon are the type of fish that begin their lives in rivers, which is a freshwater environment. And as they get older, they migrate out to the sea. That's where they're then exposed to salt water. And then they will return to those rivers and lakes in order to lay their eggs for their next generation. So salmon have to be able to deal with um, high levels of salt and high levels of fresh water. So when the salmon are in fresh water, they will have a high filtration rate, they will produce high volumes of urine, and they're um, able to take in salt as much as possible through their secretory cells. When they're in the seawater, so um, the main part of their life cycle when they've gone out to sea, their filtration rate changes to be uh, quite low. They produce low amounts of urine and their secretory cells do the function of getting rid of that excess salt. So salmon are really interesting in that they're able to cope with the changes in their environment um, by changing the way that they carry out osmoregulation. So the kidneys in the salmon are really quite specialised that they're able to change these different things depending on whereabouts they're located. So now we're going to have a look at the next stop point, which is looking at evidence uh, to explain the relationship between the conservation of water and the production and excretion of concentrated nitrogenous wastes in a range of Australian insects and terrestrial mammals. So through this video, I just really um, point out a few simple examples of Australian organisms. So as you do the research yourself, you need to make sure that the examples that you look at are specifically Australian insects and Australian terrestrial mammals. So water conservation in insects is a little bit different to the other types of animals that we've talked about so far. So insect tissues release nitrogenous wastes as soluble uric acid into the body fluid. And this is then absorbed by various tubules before passing into the insect's hindgut. The low pH in the tubules causes the uric acid to precipitate out as crystals. So it's a little bit different to the way that we get rid of our nitrogenous wastes. Um, there's a lot less water involved with the uric acid. Uh, in the rectum, there is also selective reabsorption of water and ions, which does happen in our kidneys, but it happens in our kidneys and not in our rectum. And the big thing to note is insects do not urinate. So the uric acid passes out with their food wastes, so through their rectum, in almost a dry form. So insects are found in most terrestrial environments, including deserts and grasslands, where water is scarce. Most insects ob obtain their water sorry, from plants, so such as this guy, our grasshopper up here, who eats leaves and obtains the water from the leaves. Our butterfly here, who sucks the nectar from flowers, and an aphid here. So he's actually got a projection that comes out of his mouth and goes into the plant and he sucks the sap out of the plant. So by doing this, these insects are gaining water as well as the nutrients that they need to survive. Some insects living in dry conditions can go without food or water for several days. So an example of this is the Australian plague locust. Okay, so there's an Australian example for you that you can use to do a little bit more research for this task. Your grasshopper, butterfly and aphids, uh, you may need to do some research to find specific Australian examples of each of those so you can use them for this. Waste eliminated during this time are dry, but once the green food is available again, the waste becomes moister. So the organism is able to change the amount of water that they excrete um, depending on the amount of water that's available in their environment. 
So water conservation in terrestrial mammals, we've talked about this quite a bit, but again, we'll just cover it off um, to make this uh, dot point. So terrestrial mammals experience continual problems with water loss. Okay, obviously being in a terrestrial environment, we don't always have a constant supply of water. So we're always needing to make sure that we're not losing too much water and we're not going long periods of time without replacing it. So mammals excrete urea, which does not require much energy for production. However, it does take up a lot of water. The mammalian kidney is adapted to allow the production of either concentrated or dilute urine. So we've looked at that quite a bit. We've looked at um, why reabsorption of different substances takes place in order to create either concentrated or dilute urine based on feedback from the body about levels of water. So mammals living in arid conditions show many adaptations to assist them to conserve water. So just to re sort of cap what we've looked at so far, the nephron of the adult fish is quite short in relation to that of insects and mammals. There are also differences between the nephron of freshwater and saltwater fish in terms of the size and the number of glomerulite. So here we have our adult fresh uh, adult fish, so not really looking at the difference between a freshwater fish and a saltwater fish, just a fish in general. And we can see that their nephron is quite short. Here we have our insect nephron, and we can see that it is quite long um, before it moves into the ureter, and then obviously the mammalian nephron, which we've looked at quite considerably, and it is quite extensive with a number of varying different parts whose role are uh, to reabsorb different substances whenever necessary based on feedback from the body. So the insect nephron is quite different in terms of structures and size compared to both our fish and our mammal. So we haven't really gone into too much detail about any specific mammals and how they um, work in order to maintain or produce different concentrations of urine to conserve water. So that's your job now is to um, go and do some more research and find out a little bit more about that. And that's the end of this video. Thank you.